Good morning, or good day. I'm your host, Michelle Graves, on today's segment of The Power of Money. And as always, I am delighted that you have invited me into your homes, your offices, whatever your venue today. I have a phenomenal show for you, a special show. Uh, I will be interviewing a remarkable gentleman on the field of education. He is an educational consultant. He is a young man, and he is a man on a mission. And so I am honored, privileged, and delighted to bring to all of you for the next hour a gentleman, L. Colby Wilkerson, who resides in the city of Atlanta, Georgia, to talk with all of us. And I'm going to be listening hard because it's, this young man is so impressive to me. He moves my soul, viewers, and I think you're going to feel the same way. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce him to all of you today. Sit down because you're going to enjoy this show with L. Colby Wilkerson, who is a, just a master in the field of education and educational consulting, and he is concerned about our children. Of course, you know I love children and I love seniors. Those are my two heart spots. So without further ado, let me introduce you to L. Kobe Wilkerson. And how are you today? Hey, good morning. Good to have you here. I so appreciate you coming on my show today to talk about a subject that is so near and dear to me and certainly so near and dear to you and that is the subject of our children and education but before going any further would you please give our viewers a little bit of information about who you are and why I am so excited to have you in my studio wonderful uh, thank you for having me oh gosh uh, my uh, my honor uh, I'm originally from Cincinnati Ohio okay uh, born and raised there and then uh, shortly after that uh, I went to Kentucky State University uh, I always knew that I wanted to work with children, uh, but I thought it was going to be doing something a little bit differently, actually. Originally, I wanted to be a pediatrician. Ha! Huh. Yeah, so I okay. thought I, would, I wanted to do that, but then as I uh, started going and getting ready to go off to college, I realized I really couldn't do it with children, what I really wanted to do with them, uh, being a pediatrician. So I switched my major uh, to education. Okay. And so at Kentucky State, I majored in education and sociology and then got a minor in psychology as well. My goodness. Yeah, so okay. I graduated there with uh, two degrees and a minor and then uh, shortly after that I taught kindergarten. Uh, so the little ones oh, love that. Oh, the little ones. Yeah, oh, I had, I had a blast. Learned a lot. I'm Learned sure. Learned a lot in that year. And then, I'm uh, sure. And then went off to Kansas State University and got my master's in education administration. And then shortly after that I uh, taught kindergarten for two years. And then I started my educational consult company, which is uh, Love to Learn Educational Group. Love to Learn Educational Group. And where is that based out of? Based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And so uh, uh, our motto is in instilling a love of learning in everyone we touch. Instilling a love of learning in everyone we touch. That's powerful. It is. It is. I think that um, I got into consulting because... I had the same kind of epiphanies uh, that teachers did, and so my, 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 my niche in the market is a little different. We would have people come in and do professional development with us and talk to us about, you know, kind of what we should be doing in the classroom and things of that nature, but I saw a gap in that no one would ever kind of come in and show us what to do. Hmm. And so that is kind of the gap that I feel, um, actually going to classrooms and do model teaching. Um, really? Yes. So explain to me how that works. Well, what I uh, normally would do is try to get what the teachers will be teaching. So their objectives or standards and actually come in and teach what they would be teaching. Uh, oftentimes you have some people who would, who would do that, but they would have these, you know, fancy lessons that they would come in and work with. And as a teacher, I'm an educator first. Mm -hmm. And so concerned about teachers not feeling like they have to make up a day. Uh, I would basically would just take what they would be teaching and kind of show them how to teach it. Uh, it's not the what you're teaching, it's the how. So it's not the information, it's how you are transmitting information to young people? Absolutely. It is, uh, I believe that there are four components to achievement. Okay. Um, the what is definitely important and a piece of that. Uh, but the four components are love, 
Okay, love. Belief in students. Belief in students. Knowledge of information. Knowledge of information. And the skills to teach. And the skills. So when a, t when a, when a, when a teacher is in the preparation mode where they're in college mm -hmm. and they're developing the skills to teach, mm -hmm. hopefully they have a desire mm -hmm. to teach, but that's not necessarily always the case. They may want to, they may view teaching as a good avocation mm -hmm. and therefore develop the skill sets. But those other three, mm -hmm. which you talk about the love, right. the belief, no, the belief mm -hmm. and the knowledge of the information. And the knowledge mm -hmm. so important as well. So you bring those into your uh, model as well when you teach and, and work with teachers? Absolutely. We go into the classroom and show them what it actually looks like with their kids. Oh my goodness. So you actually do uh, what we call a practicum, where they literally watch you do. Absolutely. My goodness. Absolutely. And can you can you say with some level of um, of um, integrity that your presence it does create a difference in that classroom environment? The teaching that you show them. Absolutely. It, it's one thing for you to come and you know tell people about what they quote unquote should be doing mm -hmm. uh, with their kids. And my belief is if you're going to talk to teachers about teaching, that you should be a master teacher. I couldn't agree more. You know, but that's I not always the case. Okay. And so my model is, is that uh, I can show you better than I can tell you. Well, let's talk about this issue of education and teaching and what I call um, a major paradigm shift mm -hmm. from the old model mm -hmm. of you sit there and I tell you to a model that's more interactive and perhaps more challenging for teachers today. Where do you see education today? Well, education, I mean, there's definitely a space for that. I think that what we've come to know throughout the research and, and studying mm -hmm. is that kids learn in a multifaceted of ways. And so what that's it's different for some teachers who are used to a traditional model. Mm -hmm. And so you have a cooperative grouping and, you know, differentiated instruction and you have all of these terms um, and teaching teachers to actually be facilitators. Facilitators. Of, it, of the uh, knowledge and information as opposed to, um, there's a term that they say, the, uh, the sage on the stage. Okay. You know, where, you know, a teacher is just kind of standing in the front of the room and just kind of you know, dictating everything. Yeah. Like a symphony? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. And okay. So, um, but you know you cannot direct a symphony unless you have been trained to be a good Yeah, you gotta have a ear for all the other Yeah, you know, yeah. Staying you, with that analogy. Yeah, yeah you, you, do. you gotta you have to stay okay. Yeah, so you have to mm -hmm. have a ear for that. But um, I think teachers I, I'm I'm definitely a pro teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in teachers. Um, you know, there's a a lot of, you know, information out there that says, you know, do, do you know enough about students to teach them? And uh, the reality of the situation is that 85% uh, of the teachers who are teaching um, um, African American and minority students are white women. And so My goodness, let me see that 85% of the teachers who are teaching African American and Latina children are white females? Are white females. And that's the reality of the situation. My goodness. Yeah. Now, are there, are, are when we, the, the color thing is not as disturbing as the culture thing. Right. Because uh, we know that white people are not a monolithic group. Right. They're all kinds of, Absolutely. Uh, from different experiences. So, can you, are there, is there any data regarding the cultural backgrounds of many of these teachers? Well, I mean, not, not that I can per se, I mean, you just got, though, you know, white, black, mm -hmm. you know, Hispanic, and so that's the data that, that mm -hmm. you're looking at. But it's, it's about actually having a culturally relevant pedagogy um, that teachers can actually, you know, be able to deliver with some type of, uh, you know, confidence and, and be able to connect, because that's really what it's about. It's about a connecting piece. And so uh, that's another piece of the work that I do is around transformation, because Sometimes you're doing things and you don't realize that you're doing mm -hmm. things. You're not really aware of what it is that you believe. Okay. And so your actions are coming from somewhere. Um, okay. And so what it is is the work that I try to do in regards to transformation is help you to see why you do what you do. 
for the teacher. Absolutely. And what are you finding? Well, uh, a lot of times people don't know. You know, you, you go and you just do things and you get into this operation mode where you're just doing things over and over and mm -hmm. over, and but you're not really understanding why you do it. You know, you go to the gym because you believe something or you don't eat meat because you believe something. Right. So out of all of your actions, there's a belief system that is pushing that, that are pushing those actions. And so when you're working with kids, uh, whether you are aware of it or not, there's an underlying belief system mm -hmm. there that is causing you to operate how you operate. And sometimes you're not even aware of it. And so- My goodness, uh, you do know what you're saying. Absolutely. That is, that is troubling to me. Well, that's kind of how people operate. All I it, agree. It's not just an that's education. That's why you have your psychology background. Yeah, it's not just an uh, education. It's 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 all in all relationships. You mm -hmm. know, with the uh, how you operate in marriage and you know mother to daughter, and mm -hmm. there's a reason why you're doing. Because sometimes you have these underlying beliefs, uh, which are guiding your actions that you're not even aware of. And so, what I kind of do when we do the professional development pieces, we kind of you know, stop and, and ask some of those questions. And mm -hmm. uh, that's the thing that I set up. I say, I don't, I don't have all the answers, but doggone it, I got some really good questions. Oh my goodness, it, but it is the questioning. It is, and, and, so, mm -hmm. and it's about an internal look. Mm -hmm. It's about looking internally. And so uh, some of the questions are asked is, you know, what do you believe uh, about education? You know, what do you believe about parents? Uh, what do you believe about teachers? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you see your role? And it's about creating a culture that sustains ability, you know, mm. and it's about the sustainment of it. And, you know, you can go in and you can change uh, an environment kind of really quickly, but will it sustain? Right. And so that's because if, if the teacher who is basically uh, the master in the classroom, mm -hmm has an underlying belief system that is um, perhaps um, degrading perhaps mm -hmm. or um, has a perspective that says that these children can't succeed mm -hmm. I'm just doing the best I can but really they don't have what it takes to succeed does that uh, does that infiltrate the classroom environment? Absolutely. Do children pick that up? Absolutely. I mean, oh my God. Every, everything, everything yeah. is energy. Right. You know, I believe that. Everything I is energy. I absolutely believe that. And so uh, that takes me to the work that I'm doing now. I'm actually now working on my uh, doctorate, my PhD at the University of South Carolina. Okay. And, um, well, congratulations. I'll shake your hands oh, on thank that. Thank you so much. That is so, very good. Yeah, seeking to be Dr. Wilkerson. Okay. But that's the gap in the eight I'll years. I'll still call you El Kobe. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> you can do that. But that's the uh, gap mm -hmm. that I've seen uh, in professional development is that there is no space for personal development. And my belief is that there cannot really be any effective professional development without personal development because what you bring to the table is you. Exactly. And so what we, I believe that we've done a poor job in, in education is, is the, taking the time to actually develop uh, the teachers and, and give them an opportunity to kind of pour it to themselves. Uh, there's a African proverb that says, be, be weary when a naked man offers you his shirt. Ah, that's good. And so that's good. The, the whole purpose of that analogy is that you, you cannot give what you do not have. Right. And so going back to the four components of the achievement, love, belief in students, knowledge of information, and the skills to teach. Uh, if you don't love, if you don't have love within yourself, you, you can't give it. And so what you do is you, you bring what you have. And so if you're, if you're disappointed in, in your life and you're frustrated, in your life and uh, you know you're kind of irritated and you have all of these things going on in your life this is what you bring mm. these are the things that you bring and so um, in my you know dissertation work that's the, the piece that I'll be working on is is how do we effectively uh, infuse a, prof a personal development piece into prof into professional development so that teachers become better people do we want you to be a better teacher? Of course, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a but, given. Yeah, That's but a at given. the end of the day, we, we just need you to be better. We want you to be a better mother. We want you to be a better yes. sister, yes. a better brother, yes. a better husband. Right. We just need you to be better because 
who you are you bring to everything and so if you're just better of course you're going to be a better teacher mm -hmm. but I think there needs to be some intentionality um, in that environment where you're spending you know six to eight sometimes teachers are spending nine to ten hours a day there needs to be some type of mechanism put there to kind of really help them uh, be better thems. <laughs> that that <laughs> is that is um, that is a serious undertaking. Yeah, but it's needed. Oh, I could not agree with you more because truthfully, if a person is not of good character, right, uh, I would think that somehow that would that would have to manifest in a classroom it, environment. It shows up. It's got to show up because it up. it's it's too intimate when mm -hmm. you're with children mm -hmm. for long periods of time. The cracks have got to show, mm -hmm. do. right? They do. Okay, because I'm not in that that in industry, but I would have to believe intuitively that if you are teaching and little people are like little, you know, bzzz, mm -hmm. they pick up everything, and if you are really not a good person. Mm -hmm they have to pick that up and that would have to have a depressing uh, impact on their learning wouldn't you think? Well it's not just on them but the whole environment mm. you know what I mean? and so it's not like I said it, it has an impact on the teacher that's next door it has an mm. impact on, wow. on you know the principal administration and and all of that and so it takes something and the whole thing is people people don't change because they just want to you know, there there has to be a reason. There has they have to see a benefit. In so, that. how do you incentivize a person that is a rat? Well, I mean, you have to show them the benefit and how it impacts their life. You know, it's that old uh, analogy. That, you know, no matter what uh, people station that they're tuned into, they're all they're tuned into that. You know, what is it? W I F M, and mm -hmm. you know, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And so, people are always looking to that. And when you go about transformation which is different than change um, it is it's completely different you can't mm -hmm. say you need to do this uh, transformation is a isn't about doing anything mm -hmm. transformation is about being something that's powerful yeah can I quote that transformation is about being, being something, something. It's about that's very important to me because that's how I live my life mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. which is we must ever be present and ever aware and mm -hmm. ever conscious of who we are and what we bring to our fellow mankind. Right. And it has to be positive. Has to be. Well, it has to be. In, but the, in professional development, what we're trying to do is get teachers to do something. Okay. You know, you well, need tell to, me more. You, you tell need, me you more. You need to do this, and you need to mm -hmm. do this curriculum, and uh, you know, you need to teach this way. And while that is a piece of the puzzle. You know, I think the bigger piece of the puzzle, you know, when I come it's you know, I always tell them, say, I, I, I come in peace. Yes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, 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 I come in peace, yes. you know, uh -huh. and, um, you know, my goal is to not have you do anything. Okay. My goal is to have you be something, you know, and it's hard to be something that you've never seen. My God. So when you say never seen, can you give that? Can you give me a, 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 a how that plays out? What does that mean? Well, that's uh, it's it's one thing. The thing that I've learned in this in these the past seven or eight years that I've been doing this is that something happens when a teacher sees not just good instruction happening, but good instruction happening with their kids. Okay. That's the model teaching piece. That's that's the power in it. It's one thing for you to see, uh, go in and maybe even look and see and uh, watch another teacher teach. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You see. You see this. The strategies that they're using, and you know, you see what they're doing. But it's something happens when a teacher sees you being effective with their kids that they work with on a daily basis it mm. it brings about a sense of it can be done and it can uh -huh. be done with with my kids because I see it being done because they own those kids you know those are their children those are those are their children yes, literally. and so it's one thing for you to go into another class and see a teacher be effective with their kids um, you know, you expect that because they have a relationship and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But it's it does something. It does something to a teacher when when they see 
you know, it being done, quality instruction really being done and connecting with their kids and, you know, how you move around, it, it gives them a sense of hope and it hopefully allows them to see something that they haven't done. And that's my thing is that you, you'll learn more watching me teach, you know, a 45 to 60 minute lesson than you will ever learn from me standing up and telling you, you know, what you should do, you know, mm -hmm. for two and a two and a half hour, three hour, you know, professional development because there's going to be some things that I'm just going to do innately that I'm not even going to be aware of because it's just what I do. And but but the power of that. And who you are. Yeah, and who and I am. And who you are. That's and so important. the piece of that, mm -hmm. those two pieces together uh, make a powerful uh, connection, you know, because when you put them together, you say, okay, now I hear it, now I see it. Because when I f first started doing this, I got a lot of flack because, uh, you know, it's love, you know, belief in students. And then you got knowledge of information and the skills to teach less. And, and those were given to me um, by a mentor of mine, Asa Hilliard, mm -hmm. uh, who passed, who was a professor down at, at um, Georgia, Georgia State University. Um, phenomenal mind. He was a jewel to this planet very, very, very heavy impact uh, in, in the work of around educating African-American children. Mm. Um, the world misses him. And, but he gave that to me. We were at a, at a conference up in Canada and he said, you know, the love, belief in student, those are the four components. You take that and you develop that. That's, that, that is to be yours. My goodness. And so... Uh, so he sent you off with that. Sent me off with that. So that, that is mine to to, to develop and to, yes. and to uh, share with the world. But love looks like something. It's, love does look like it something. It sounds like something. Yes, it's yes, measurable. Yes. Um, you know, belief in students looks like something. It sounds like something. Uh, knowledge of information, you know, and, and the skills to teach. So these components of achievement, uh, and he said it's an all or nothing deal. Hmm. So you can't have three out of the four. Mm -hmm. uh, but it goes back to an analogy. You, it's hard to, you cannot give. It's not hard. You cannot give what you do not have. Mm -hmm. And so in order to give love, you have to have it first yourself. Right. And, and that belief in you first to, to give, you know, to give belief in students. And, you know, you have to have the information to give and you have to have the skills. And that's where oftentimes the skills, that, because teaching is an art. I, d I believe that. It, I was blessed a, to have some amazing yeah, teachers. It's, a, it's an art. It's a skill, and it, it's a craft, and it, it has to be developed, and mm -hmm. it's a muscle, so you have to work it. And uh, the beautiful thing about teaching is no two classes are ever the same. Are you kidding? No two classes are ever the is same. Is it the children or the teacher or both? It's both. My it, gosh. Yeah, because you have the a makeup uh, of personalities, and so you know, and, and skill set. So no two classes are ever the same. And if you talk to, to any teacher who's been teaching any number of years, they'll tell you, you know, they'll tell you that. Every day. You know, well, and every year. Oh my you gosh. You know, every year is, you know, you get a class and it's different. This class is different than that class. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and so, it, you know, the makeup, the personalities and all of that. And so that's why it's really about a giving of yourself and a connecting piece. Um, and do, you know, the piece that I really work with teachers is, uh, you know, some people say, well, you know, our students, do you know enough about the students to be able to teach them and reach them? And uh, I said on the other side of the fence was, do they know enough about you to receive what it is that you have? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, do, they, do, uh, do they know who you are and from the place that you speak of, you know, do, you, are you, do they know about what it took, you know, for you to get there? Do they know about you know, some of the, the trials and the tribulations that you've had. And so there's an exercise that I do with teachers and it's, and it's called, uh, you know, telling your story. Well, tell me about that. Well, uh, pretend I'm a teacher. Well, <laughs> actually I am a teacher. Yeah, I think about money. Absolutely. I am a teacher. Absolutely. Yeah, well, it's, okay. a, it's uh, in my, of course my audience is not little people, no, well, but, that's but, okay. they're people. but they're people, but they're people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, uh, and that's what I tell them, you know, kid, all kids are smaller versions of us. My goodness. And so we, we there's an exercise that uh, we do, um, which has uh, teachers, well, well middle schools, I'll, I'll tell you about one. I was working with the school out in um, Kansas City, okay. Kansas, Northwest Middle School, where the principal is, 
uh, Dr. Donnie Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were out there doing some phenomenal work. He's a phenomenal principal. Um, in Kansas City. In Kansas City. My goodness. And great staff out there. And so what we were doing is an exercise I call, like I said, called telling your story. And then in the professional developments I use, it's, it's, I use music, I use, you know, video clips. And mm -hmm. um, this particular one, uh, I use uh, a clip from the story Rango. I don't know if you've seen that movie. Uh, yeah. A Rango. <laughs> and yeah. so, um, you know, with the little lizard and, yes. you know, yes. he's acting and yes. whatnot. And for uh -huh. those of you who haven't seen the movie, um, Rango is a lizard and uh, he has this thing where he's trying to be uh, a lot of things. He's an actor. Yeah. He, he's got some challenges. Yeah, he's definitely got, <laughs> he got some, some challenges. challenges. And yeah. so he's making up all these stories. But the piece uh, that we work on is, is, is how do you tell your story? So that your students really see you as, as human. Mm -hmm. You know, they see that, that you bleed and that you hurt. And because uh, contrary to popular belief, you know, s students will hold you in high regard that you can do, you know, no wrong. And so it's important that they see that, you know, you may be a teacher, but you might have had some struggles with education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we do in exercise is these are middle school students and uh, teachers. And that would be what grades? Uh, uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Okay, all right. That's an interesting period. Yes, yeah, sixth, seventh, and mm -hmm. eighth grade. And so I had them do an exercise where I actually had them write a letter uh, to their 13 year old self, you know, for those in sixth grade and those in seventh grade. And what would you have told yourself? You know, what would be the advice that you would give now if you could go back, you know, to your to your 12 or 13 or 14 year old self, mm -hmm. what would be that advice that you would give to them? You know, so to you yourself. So you ask them, oh, to themselves. To themselves. Okay, they write a letter to themselves that's their say 13, 13 year old self. To their 13 year old and give that person advice. And then they read that to their students. My goodness. And how is that received? Oh, it's received really well. It, well, it, it, it's good on both ends. Okay. Because what it does is it causes teachers to actually go back and look inward and reflect to see themselves as a 12 or 13 year old or 14 year old mm -hmm. for, for these teachers who are middle school teachers to see themselves then. But it also and connects them to a greater connection to these kids because they, they, they start to think like, okay, well, you know, I was 12, I was 13, I was 14 mm -hmm. year old once. But at the same time, then it gives the students an opportunity to look and to the, the teachers, teachers yes, and to their lives, yes, yes. you know, and, yes. and gives them to a teacher, the students to actually see the teacher opening up because there's something. And becoming more transparent, exactly, wouldn't you say? Exactly, absolutely. Isn't there a danger in that, though? If you are trying to establish boundaries and the minute you tell them at 12 years old, I was crazy mm -hmm. and, 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 and didn't know my head from my feet. Mm -hmm. Isn't there some level of risk in, in crossing those boundaries? Absolutely, but that but in, there's risk in, in, in everything that we do. I, I so agree. But the reward is, is far worth okay. it. Okay. Because what it does is it, it allows you to connect. Okay. And, and there's an old adage that, you know, students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And My goodness. Yeah, they Let don't say care. say that again, students don't Care, how much, care how much you know until, they, until know. they know how much you care. And that's all people. Actually, that's, all that, people. that's the truth. Yeah, and so there mm -hmm. is an, you know, every, like I said, going back to the everything is energy, people feel when you're authentic. Yes, yes. But the flip side of that is they feel when you're not. Right, right, you know, right. They feel when you're not. Right. So you know when somebody's being genuine and authentic and then you know when they're not. Mm -hmm. And so when, when teachers are being real and authentic, uh, first with themselves, okay. you know, and then with students, um, it creates a bond there where they're able to now hear mm -hmm. what it is that you have to teach them. And they know that it's coming from a genuine and a sincere place. And so that mm -hmm. creates a community because when they see that you're willing to be transparent, then they're, doing, they're willing to do the same. And so um, it's about teaching of social skills, but more importantly, it goes back to that creating a community uh, of that, that sustains achievement. You have to create that community and part of 
a critic is knowing the needs, you know, the wants, the hurts, the pains, you know, of the community that you're a part of, mm -hmm. and knowing what each person in the community is bringing, bringing to the table. Well, you know what? This is so awesome, this conversation, because I am deeply concerned and troubled, and that's why I just have such an affection for you and your vision. And the con reason I'm concerned and troubled is because young people are having to deal with incredible incredible things mm -hmm. outside of the school mm -hmm. uh, with their their communities with their parents with the family structure dissipating before our very eyes mm -hmm. the loss of any kind of religion and connectivity spiritually mm -hmm. to ground them mm -hmm. and now you're talking about digging into teachers heads mm -hmm. and trying to make them uh, evolve into the great people they are. Incidentally, I think teachers are the most underpaid people of all professions. Absolutely. I, I, I absolutely, and I know there are going to be some that say, that's just not true. They get vacation. I say, they don't get vacation. They got to do continuing ed. They got to use summer to learn. Right. Uh, but the fact that they have the power to take a child from a person who only sees from afar a future with their name on it to actually becoming that human being. Mm -hmm. and, and I can just tell you myself, I have been so blessed with incredible teachers from first grade on in a segregated school. Um, I, they were desegging and I was the first little black girl in a Kentucky school and my teacher was quite white mm -hmm. and all my other classmates were quite white mm -hmm. and I remember feeling so odd and I remember that teacher coming to me coming down to my level and hugging me mm -hmm. and telling me you are so brilliant she didn't say smart she said brilliant mm -hmm. And I believed her. That's the love. That's I, the I believed <laughs> her. And the rest is history. But mm -hmm. that little bitty encounter with a five-year-old little girl, little black girl with nappy hair mm -hmm. in an all-white school that was so scared. And yet that teacher, a um, young white woman, bent down in front of all of my peers and said what she said and gave me a hug. Mm -hmm. And that just set my world on such a different path. So. I support and, and, and believe in what you're trying to do. What do you see as the most, um, the most significant crisis facing education right now? What do you see? Oh, uh, wow. How much time we got? Ah, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> hey, is, we got, I mean, we already know, but you're is, the expert. There is, there is a lot of things that are, are, are facing education. Um, Funding, of course, um, legislative policies that are, are are not designed in the best interest of of, of students nor teachers. Um, there's a, I mean, it, it varies from state to state, but I believe that until until we make preschool mandatory for all children, um, we're still going to have the gaps that we have in education. It does start in preschool? Uh, well, you have states um, who have, where kindergarten is not even mandatory. So can you imagine, as a first grade teacher, mm -hmm. uh, you have kid A, okay, who's been, who went to preschool for two years, Okay. okay. Then they went to kindergarten, okay, for one year, and now they're in first grade, okay. And then you got student B, who has not been to preschool, has not been to kindergarten, and is also in first grade. Oh, so, that's a problem. Yeah. So you that's have a problem. This, you have this gap. Okay. You know, you know, which is they they refer to as the achievement gap. You have this gap. Uh, that you have this kid who has three years of education start with this kid who has zero okay. you know, and there's states that that don't even make kindergarten mandatory so you know i think until we get preschool mandatory you know there's states that you know preschool is not mandatory at all well what about parents that would argue i can best educate my own child because 
this whole homeschooling mm -hmm. that is so much a part of the American culture today. It mm -hmm. didn't exist when I was coming up, but it is so much a part of parents feel that they can teach their child. They don't want their child in a, quote, institutional setting. Well, I mean, that's the thing, you know, you, as a parent, you you are uh, you are uh, missioned with doing what you feel is best for your kids. Right. Um, but my whole thing is that you you take you know if your doc if your kid is sick you take them to a professional. Mm-hmm. Um, you know when your when your car's messed up you take it to a professional who's a mechanic and my thing is that people see, well, I can teach them to read and, you know, I can teach them mm -hmm. to do math, but uh, there is something to be said in in the training, you know, and going to school. And like I said, it's how to teach. Mm -hmm. It's it's not so much what you're teaching, okay, how you teach. And teachers, teachers make a difference. And that's the thing is that you can have somebody, uh, you can give them addition problems and then give okay. them addition problems. But and give them two teachers, but the way the teacher teach and the mm -hmm. how the teacher teach mm -hmm. is going to make all the difference in the world. And are you do you have the skill set to be able to kind of relate it so that it that it makes sense and then they can connect it to other things. And so uh, down in Georgia, uh, I'm in Atlanta, uh, but north of Atlanta, they call they have what they call the Platinum Triangle, um, which is up um, in it's not Norcross. But you go right up, right up 400, and they call it the Platinum Triangle. And that, in that Platinum Triangle, there's more homeschool kids, I believe, it, in in that part of the state, maybe in that country, than than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. It's something I think uh, almost 50 percent of the kids in in that area are homeschooled. Okay. Um, but parents, they feel if they feel like they have, and you got to have the right curriculum and all of that stuff, and. Um, I mean, there's a. I guess there is a, a a space for. Like I said, as a parent, you have to do what you feel is best. Mm -hmm. um, but being mindful of the fact that you want the best, uh, I would definitely, you know, depending on the background of each parent, you know, you want to take them to a professional. So I'm definitely pro pro public schools. Um, you know, you have these things with charter schools and. Um, the research states that, you know, says that there really isn't a big, big difference and the thing about public schools is they're going to get a more diverse education because mm -hmm. public schools accept everybody. Charter schools can say, we don't want you. Right. You know, we want to just take the best of the right. best. Right, right. And um, I think, you know, everybody has their opinions about that. <laughs> uh, but I think when you, when you put kids in an environment that has uh, not just diverse in population, um, but also diverse in skill set, diverse in abilities. I think it, it gives and lends something uh, to, to what people glean from that about dealing with people with differences. And, um, and some things you just can't, can't be taught, they have to be learned. And that experience of a, of a public school education really kind of supports that. Well, we both have to be honest. We both went to Walnut Hills High School. Absolutely. Yay, yes, Eagles. Eagle, Eagles. Yay. <laughs> uh, and they were, Walnut Hills was again named by. Yes, uh, top yep, 100, the top number one 100 in Ohio. In, yeah, number one <laughs> school in Ohio that was a public school. Absolutely. Is a public school. Is a public school. Everybody, um, my God, Walnut Hills High School was, was harder than college for me. Yeah, it was. Just the, the, the pressure, the stress, the diversity, the energy. Mm -hmm. All of those things, yes. and uh, so I do support uh, public education. I feel that that makes this country incredibly distinct. It does in terms of the ability to cross mesh with so many different people. But I want to shift for a minute because really, why I wanted you on this show mm -hmm. is you write books. I do, and these are great books Thank for you. children. And, um, of course, I want to show the audience, this is one book called Fred and Mary. <laughs> I love this book. Mm -hmm. um, written by L. Kobe Wilkerson and illustrated by Aaron J. Ratzloff, who does an amazing job. And can you just quickly uh, give us the story and the plot, and can people buy this book? Absolutely. Um Cause I love this book. I mean, I just love your writing style. Mm -hmm. um, 
It was just, here it is. But despite all of this, Fred was happy anyway. He went about his business, not caring what people had to say. They talked about his clothes and his beat up shoes, but none of these things gave Fred the blues. That's that right. is so good. Well, yeah, whatever they say, he just always replied, you can't talk about my hair and wink his eye. <laughs> Yeah. I love this. Gosh, he can't talk about my hair. I mean, the illustrations are so great and the value sets. Uh, where can people get this book? Uh, you can go and to a DVD, a CD inside. Yeah, we have a DVD and a CD inside. Um, this is so Fred great. And Mary was my, this was my uh, first book. Okay. And, um, you know, there's some of the illustrations. Yeah, there's I love Fred. it with the teeth. He's got yeah. these little. Little horsey teeth, because you know when we're young, we have bucky teeth. Yeah, Fred's, Fred's got some issues. You know? <laughs> yeah, Fred does. He, he's got some problems. And yeah. We have it here right there. That is the, uh, that's a picture of Fred right there. Yeah. He's got some issues there with his, uh, you know, his teeth and his hygiene. You know, uh, Fred, all Fred knew about was his hair. Yes. You know, other aspects of hygiene, I don't think he too much cared. His teeth yeah. were black and his breath had smelled, and we won't even discuss his skin and his nails. <laughs> I you love know. it. I love it. I love, do you ever do storytelling and reading? Absolutely. That is a piece of the, uh, of the work I do. I do a, a storytelling piece with the music and storytelling as oh well. Oh, my gosh. And so uh, along with, uh, you know, the, um, the, the consulting piece and the model teaching piece, I do music and storytelling. I have a, a storytelling CD that will be out with the uh, Three Little Pigs, Little Red Riding Hood, Little Old Lady That Swallowed a Fly. And, uh, Do not say an old lady swallowed a fly. Yes. I know little people love they that. They love Their it. Their imaginations are so vivid. Yes. I mean, they're so vivid. Then I saw this about married, and the and the and the priest has a a, a little a little um clothespin on, clothes on, on his nose because Fred smells so bad. Yeah, he got hooked up with Mary, and uh, Mary has some issues too. <laughs> now you know Mary was was cute and. You know, she had uh, lots of hair on her head, yeah. you know, and so, you know, she walked up to Fred and to Fred, she said, I, I really like the hair on your head, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I love and it. so Fred was shocked that she had recognized. But, but then she had, had hairy yeah. arms and hairy legs. She had some hairy arms and hairy legs. Yeah, she was cute, but she was a tad bit hairy as well. Yes. <laughs> You know, this is so amazing. And the dog on the side barking. Yeah. I mean, that is just so much fun. I love this book, but let's talk about this, my favorite all-time book. This is a book I really feel you're going to be written up in history. And I say that. I've met and dealt with and interviewed many people over the course of my life. But mm -hmm. I must tell you, this book called Queen Infinity, mm -hmm. and I know it's in its and yes, Queen yeah. Infinity. This oh, is actually yeah. what yeah. they call the blue line copy. Uh, the books are literally being printed as we speak. Goodness gracious. Uh, so we will actually have the actual copies of the book uh, toward the end of this month. But Queen Infinity is a wonderful story uh, about literacy and leadership. Uh, wow. It's about a little girl who's the queen of Zizaman B. Ziza Man B. Hey, Ziza Where did you Man come B. up with that name? And so uh, it just it just came to me. So Ziza Man B is a made up land, but uh, um, you know the story starts off. It says, "Once upon a time in the land of Ziza Man B lived the prettiest queen of all, and her name was Infinity." And some folks wonder why they called her that because she grew pretty every day. Imagine that, and along with her beauty, her knowledge and wisdom grew too. And how did for sure? No one really knew, but we know this is a fact. And it's true to be, she had the largest library that you ever did see. And some speculate and others say that she read a book and sometimes two every single day. Mm. And so every day at noon is Ziza Man B. Everyone told them there's Ziza Box. I love this little girl, though, with her glasses. Where's the there pictures? So there's the, there's her favorite, her favorite place, place, which is the library. And then we have. And all know, the people the in her. Box. Yeah, the Ziza Box. <laughs> shop. And so, but here is. Where is here's the queen? Look at the queen. There's the queen. So with her round glasses and her look at her hairdo. Yeah. So and then she has her. She's trying to. Uh, you know, everybody in her land loves reading. 
you know, so they think that she's a wonderful queen. Yes. She does so great by people. And I look at the diversity of people in her kingdom. Absolutely. And the little baby laughing from his belly. That's just how children laugh, yeah. too. They just giggle and just do it. I just, such a, I, oh my goodness. So she girl. has an evil uncle, and his name is King, King Arrogant. Arrogant. Mm. And so, you know, King Arrogant, you know, he wasn't very tall, but you know what else? His brain was small. Ah. Oh. You know, but see that the spirit of reading was the exact opposite in his land. See, King Arrogant hated reading so much that he burned every book that he ever read or touched. Now, huh. between me and you, that sounds really bad, but he's only read one book in his life and two is all he's ever had. You know. Oh, so, he it, sounds like he's got yeah. issues. Yeah, so he stand up and say, you all listen to me. I'm the smartest man that could ever be. I know the whole alphabet from A to P. And then this <laughs> Queen <laughs> Infinity yeah. said. Yeah, which your highness didn't know if the alphabet ended in Z. <laughs> Where can people get this book? Uh, Queen Infinity will actually be available. We'll have I it, love um, this girl. Let's look at this picture. Can I get a close-up of this little girl? This little girl is absolutely amazing. Queen Infinity. Re yeah, let me do that again. Just look at her. Yeah. Reading her book. Yes, with her big round glasses and her absolutely amazing braided pony topped hair. Yeah, you'll be able to get them at booksbycobe.com, but what actually what we're going to be doing with this is actually putting it on kickstarter.com. 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 And so you can actually go and support oh. uh, and, and, and get and pre order the book before it actually gets here. And so in about a week, you'll be able to go to kickstarter.com. Okay, uh, look for kickstarter com. Look for Queen Infinity and go ahead and pre order Gosh. and support uh, this wonderful project. I must have my own copy yes. and you must sign it Absolutely. because this book is headed to major awards. Well, let me tell, show you what's so okay. powerful about this book as well, is that in the back of the book, um, there is an appendix. There's an appendix of golden information here. And so we have all the literary genre, literary devices. Um, I saw the numbers. The yeah. I saw a periodic table in yes, here. Yes, there's a periodic uh, yes, table Yes, I couldn't right believe there. that. And so we have the president. I mean, of the that's States. that's basic science, and Absolutely. then social. That's amazing. And so, being again, once again, a teacher, you know, I'm writing a book for the perspective of a teacher, so a teacher can actually use this, you know, and it goes across. A part yeah, of learning. and it goes across all. All content areas. So this is phenomenal so story. Uh, getting oh, I teachers love this to, girl. You know, to own their lives. Uh, to, I mean, students to own their life and talking to students about real leadership. This uh, is. I, I tell you, when you introduced me to Queen Infinity, I just thought of all kinds of people, relatives, children, friends, grandparents, grand, uh, just church people. Everybody needs this book because it is so important that our children be affirmed to greatness. Absolutely. This, I believe, is a God destiny that there's no such thing as a mistake. Mm -hmm. Every child is purposed and every child has the right to excel in whatever gifts bestowed upon them before they were even born. Mm -hmm. And so what you are doing, I feel, is so uh, ahead of the curve and and I will just say with great pride that I am delighted to have been involved with you in my money game money rules mm -hmm. piece to begin to educate young people about uh, money and mm -hmm. wealth and mm -hmm. understanding how all of these things work together yes. I am so concerned about that because the message that so many of them get in their home life mm -hmm. and in the life called outside of school is that they can't be anything right and that um and that's not true and mm -hmm. that they cannot be leaders and own companies and and own own islands and own assets and yet as children the leaders of the world start teaching their children very early mm -hmm. that their children are going to run things mm -hmm and are going to to reign over things mm -hmm. and are going to have only the best right they never teach in terms of mediocrity mm -hmm. that's what I've learned over 36 years of working with with wealth they teach their children that it is your rightful inheritance and entitlement mm -hmm. to be wealthy to be successful to have um, all of the good things mm -hmm. and not that I discredit 
things that are not good. Mm -hmm. But I do feel that it would be very, very helpful mm -hmm. if our children began to have the experience of defining their own life purpose. Right. And then being surrounded by adults and loving teachers who were uh, excited mm -hmm about the outcome of their youthful decisions. Right. Um, Kobe, as a child, I made a decision, two things. I wanted to be a scientist. Mm. Oh yeah, because I loved flowers and plants and, and much to my mother's chagrin, I loved rats, <laughs> white ones, and I was always doing stuff. And um, I loved math, I loved chemistry, I loved those things. Mm -hmm. And to find myself at this point in my life actually doing exactly what I dreamt about mm -hmm. and did. I, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. And so my life is very full because mm -hmm. I really believe that uh, it is an intentional and that with intention comes fulfillment. Right. So I'm excited about that. Well, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, we only have um, a few minutes left. Are there any snippets that you'd like to share with my viewers today? that you think they need to begin to apply in their own lives with children that can help a child to uh, make that leap to, to the top? Uh, I, it, it doesn't matter how old your child is. I think uh, the best thing that you can do is actually read you know, with children and read with families and actually um, sit down and actually take the time to actually bond as a family around, around books because mm -hmm. everything that you want, you can read about. Whatever it is that you need, you can you can find it in a book. Okay. And so you know, getting them and exposing them to whatever opportunities, or, you know, listening to what it is that they want to be, um, you know, find a book about it, sit around and read about it. But you know, especially your little ones, make sure you're taking the time uh, to read. So with them. reading does work. Absolutely. It Absolutely. allows their imagination. Exposure. Exposure. This is okay. exposure. You okay. Know, and it can happen through books. Taking them to the library. Great. Great, taking them to the library, taking them to you know Barnes and Nobles. You know, even if you you, you can't, uh, like I said, afford to buy the books, go around and and, and have them look at them and see them. You know, yes. what's just but the just the exposure and getting them because that's the thing is whatever you want, you know, you can you can read about it. And that is so exciting. You can read about it. The imagination, the exactly. power of the imagination. Well, viewers, this has been an awesome, awesome, awesome experience for me to have a, a gentleman that I have to call a giant, an emerging giant in the field of education. And he loves children and so do I. And I just want to thank all of you for uh, allowing us into your homes and uh, into your hearts, hopefully, this past hour where we've talked about the challenges in education, uh, a little bit about what Mr. Wilkerson is doing, Please keep your eyes on this amazing book, Queen Infinity. Yes. Yeah, Booksbykobe.com. Booksbykobe.com. K-O-B-I-E. And uh, K-O-B-I-E. Uh, Booksbykobe.com. And uh, again, just we, we wish him only the best as he continues uh, his journey to success. And uh, incidentally, he's already an, a success because he is doing exactly what he has been purposed to do. And so I want to thank all of you for listening in and viewing. And I appreciate you being a part of my world on today's segment of The Power of Money with Michelle Graves, your host. You take care and God bless.